Good morning, everyone. I am glad to see you. It's glad to, it's just wonderful to be together and worship God. Amen? Amen. Now, I got to tell y'all, you know, summer it gets slow. I mean, one of these days I'm going to put you in the middle, you know? It's like I got to look on all different sides. I need to put y'all in the same place here. So, but we are so glad to be together and to worship God. And we're way, Jonathan, thank you for starting us off so wonderfully. We have Jonathan DeWitty as our guest musician today, which is wonderful to have him blessing us. And so thank you for being here, Jonathan. It is good to have all of you here. We are glad to have our friends at home that are watching. Um, so glad that you are part of our congregation as well. It is a good day to worship God, amen? amen. And we are here to do so. Just I'm a quick pull your attention to a few of the announcements. I do want to remind you about the 1010 prayer time. Um, prayer, that is a time at 10 o'clock, 1010, so you can remember when you have to be here. Um, outside this door right here in that corner, my left, your right, a group of people get together to pray because I believe that prayer undergirds everything we do. We cannot do anything without God's prayer giving us that foundation. And so they are a group of people that are praying for this church, for the ministries of this church, for everything that's happening in this church. We pray for individuals, um, and everybody is invited. If you believe in the power of prayer to come at 1010 and be a part of this praying group to undergird everything we are doing here. Um, it is a time to pray for people you know that are maybe be struggling going through a difficult time or even to say I need prayer would you pray for me so please remember the 1010 prayer time it's very important for the life of this church um, we just finishing up with our mission moment for July collecting um, school supplies for some of the students in need at uh, Philippi Elementary School and I've had a few people asking questions about my book club that's talked about it is um, this book is listed you order it ahead of time read it ahead of time and we get together and it's just a one-time discussion on this book it's a fast read and so we, it's not you read a chapter and we talk about read the whole book and then we talk about what does it mean to be in mission what does it mean for us to have the heart of mercy to help others? How do we do that? And that will be sort of the discussion we'll be having, based somewhat on the model of the Zoe Empowers. But it really, we want to talk about what is it that God is calling us to do as people um, with the mission of God in our hearts. So that's what that discussion, but read it ahead of time and then come in and we just have some good discussion, we relax and good conversation. So I am so glad that all of you are here. I'm glad that your, our friends at home are here and it is just a time to join our hearts together. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So let's join in worship. I invite you to stand if you're able. Our opening hymn is Majesty, um, within His Majesty. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Would you please all join with me in our call to worship? O oh, gracious and holy God, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you. Give us diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you. Give us eyes to see you and a heart to meditate on you. And give us, O oh God, a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now would you please all join with me in the affirmation of faith. Let us affirm our faith. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come. We follow Christ, who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people, he transforms lives, and calls us to join his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised again by God, and reigns over all creation. And, and he bids, bids us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing of the world. We are moved by the Holy Spirit together with the communion of saints as members of the body of Christ, God's holy universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sins the power of the resurrection and the reality of eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to follow Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Amen.
Am I on now? Okay. Wow. I just want to sit and listen to you, Jonathan. <laughs> I should have not written a sermon and just let you play. <laughs> they would have liked that. <laughs> so. As we gather in the sanctuary, listening to beautiful music, can you feel God's presence? Can you feel that God is here calling each of us, calling each of us, saying, I'm here, let me into your heart. I'm here, we've got work for you to do. I'm here. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, you are here. We feel your presence. We feel your touch. And we are thankful. Oh, Lord, you do call us to live the impossible dream, to do things that we think we cannot do, but for you, all things are possible. We just need to believe, Lord, and hold on to you. Forgive us when we doubt, doubt you, doubt ourselves, lose confidence in that you have called us to be your people, to share the light and the love into a dark world. Forgive us for getting overwhelmed by something that seems impossible. But yet, for you, nothing is impossible. Everything you call us to do, Lord, we get nervous, we get scared, but yet, we feel your presence walking with us. Through all the challenges of life, through all the difficulties that we face, you are there, and we can make it. We can make it in your name, Lord. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to, to fill each person here and those at home, to fill our presence that you are with us. For all people who are struggling right now with difficulties, may your Holy Spirit be upon them bringing healing, healing for physical illnesses, for emotional struggles, for all those things that are in front of us where you call us to, to share your gospel. And we get nervous and scared. So bring healing for us, Lord, healing as a church, that we can truly do your work. I pray for all people who are struggling right now with grief, with loneliness, with fear, with addiction, whatever their struggle is right now, Lord, you know what's on their hearts. Touch them right now, Lord. Remind them that nothing is impossible because you are with us. Oh Lord, I, I pray that I lift up this church to you. We are a community of believers that want to share you with the world. So give us your vision, your hope, your courage to be the people you call us to be. And it is with that courage that we join our voices together, feeling the strength of each other and of you as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Pray for me as I pray for you. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the heart of your faithful. Open our hearts and our minds to hear the particular message that you have for each of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Well, I've got to warn you about something. I am an Olympic fanatic. I love the Olympics. I went to the 1984 Olympics in LA and spent two weeks there just soaking it all in. And ever since then, I'm just, I love the Olympics. So the next four weeks, my sermons are gonna be connected to the Olympics because they are a great reminder to us of the people that we're called to be, I believe. So you can tell me at the end of it if you felt that way too. So I want to start out by just giving you a little history of the Olympics, all right? Just so you have a little better understanding of what's going on. The, the original Olympics started in 776 BCE. Think about that. 776 years before Christ. And it started in the district of Olympia in Greece. And just like now, they would uh, meet every four years, but they went on for six months. It was a time of, of uh, different celebrations, but they were around at different places. So it went on a lot longer. It was religious in nature. It was a religious festival, basically, honoring Zeus, the god of Zeus. The original competitions were wrestling, javelin throwing, discus, let me see if I can get a long jump, and uh, chariot racing. It was men only, and actually men only for spectators as well. 
So in 393, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, CE, after Christ, they abolished the ruler that was the Roman emperor at that time, abolished the Olympic Games because he felt like it was pagan worship and honoring pagan worship, and he stopped it at that time. Well, if you watch the opening, uh, opening Olympics just recently, you may have heard them talking about a Frenchman by the name of, I hope I don't mess up his name, um, Goberlin, Goberlin. Because in 1894, he, made the, he started this push to bring back the modern day Olympics as we know it right now. He fought to have them reinstated because he felt like that, that sports were a good way of reaching out to all people and could influence good moral character and the importance of physical fitness as well. And so he, it was very important for him and he also saw these Olympic Games as being important in finding the peace that we all sought for. So he worked really hard to push and um, reinstate the Olympic Games at that time. And one of the things he also wanted to reinstate was the Olympic truce. The Olympic truce was a, a sort of an agreement by all the countries that, that there would be a peace during the time of the Olympics. Now again, remember that their period of time was a little bit different, but that, that during that time there was truce so that people could travel from their countries, not only the athletes, but spectators, there was a peace that was honored. And get this, this year, the IOC President Bach came, went to the United Nations General Assembly and he called on them to reinstate and honor the Olympic truce. And listen to his words. He said this, in this fragile world, this Olympic truce resolution is more relevant than ever. In these difficult times, this resolution is our opportunity to send an unequivocal signal to the world, yes, we can come together, even in times of wars and crisis. Yes, we can join hands and work together for a better future. Well, our scripture today says the same thing. Our scripture comes from Ephesians 2. And Paul is talking about the fact that um, during this time, Jews and Gentiles were considered separate. There was a barrier, a line that could not be crossed. And, and it was something that he felt like was wrong. And so he was calling for that peace and that unity of all believers as well. And he says that through Jesus, we have been given the way to do that. And I start at verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law which it, with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. 
In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Let me read that last verse. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Christ's death on the cross for us has broken the barriers between Jews and Gentiles, he said. Christ's death on the cross has broken the barriers that we try to live by. They are not, they are man-made barriers, not God's barriers. And Jesus came to bring reconciliation to all peoples that we are one under the name of Jesus. He came to bring peace, came to bring hope, not division. Where do we see this emphasis in the Olympic Games? Well, I wanna, there's two things I think that we can look at as a good reminder for each of us. The first is a parade of nations. Did you see that it, it, it was a little different this year, wasn't it? They came by boat instead of walking into a stadium. But yet, it is the recognition of many nations in our country, not our country, in our world. And it is a reminder that it is not about us. Let me just say, we in the United States are horrible because we think the world revolves around us. It doesn't. Jesus is saying it revolves around God, on Jesus, the hope of the world, and not the United States. So the prayer of nations to me is a wonderful time in which we can see that we are just part of many. <laughs> if you watched it, do you find you're going, where is that country? Where is that? The, uh, the one thing I did miss this year, they couldn't really do it with the boats, is they usually, when they would give um, the name, they'd maybe put it a um, globe or a little of where the country was that they were. I sort of missed that. So I, there are a few of them I had no idea, and I had to go do it myself. Um, but there are a few names. Have you all heard of, um, and I will bot butch these names up, Aretheia? or Eswa, Eswatina, uh, Turkmenistan, and Yuz, uh, Uzbekistan. I don't know. And the one, I, there was another one, I don't even know how to say this, Azerbaijan. Like I said, I butchered these names. But there's this list of obscure countries that we don't even know where they are, can't even say their names. But yet, they are there in this parade of nations and so excited to be there. Um, one of the churches I served had a Micronesian community um, that worshiped with us and was part of our church. And it really brought me home to this well, one time during the Olympics says, they talked about how excited they were when their country, a very small island, um, was in the prey of nations and they saw their country, that they were there in the Olympics too. And it reminded me that it's not about the competition, it's, well, some of it, but it's about being there, to be in part of the whole. And that's what we need to remember is that we are part of the whole. And that's what Jesus is telling us is that we are part of the whole. That we are part of the kingdom of God working together for a greater purpose. A purpose beyond us. God's kingdom that's out there. 
Think about it, in the Olympics, everybody starts together at the exact same point. Nobody has medals, nobody has won anything, everybody has the hope that they could win. Everybody starts at the same place. And we do that as a kingdom of God, as far as we have the hope that Jesus gives us. We are all one together. And it's a great reminder for all of the churches and communities of faith. When we get too self-focused, when we get too caught up in ourselves and our needs and our wants, especially the wants, um, we lose focus with what we're supposed to be doing, to be a part of the kingdom of God. We're all together. We have to get that message, is that we are all one together in God's kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever get excited about being part of God's kingdom? Probably not. We don't think about it a whole lot, but think about it. The parade of nations, the parade of God's kingdom in the world. That we're called to be part of it and to spread it and carry it forward. To get excited. Because we believe in the power of God's kingdom. We believe that Jesus came to make a difference, to change the world. And we're part of that. That's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to break down the barriers between us. Because when we're too focused on barriers and our energy is going that way, we can't do the work that we are called to be. And there's different kinds of barriers. Paul is talking about the Mosaic law, the laws of Moses, the barriers between the Jews and Gentiles. But Jesus' ministry showed us that there are so many kind of barriers that we put, and they're man-made barriers in our minds and how we see differences. Jesus came to turn the world upside down, to make a difference in a different name. For me, one of the great symbols of the Olympics uh, in that sense that we are all one is the refugee Olympic team. The refugee Olympic team. It was started in the 2000, or 2016 Olympics, so it's only been going three years. I was looking, when, during the Prayer of Nations, I was looking to see if, if we were going to have another Olympic refugee team, and they were second behind Greece. And the purpose of this team three Olympics ago was that there were countries that were not allowed to participate or they refused to participate or the wars that were going on, like all, so many things. But there were these great athletes that wanted to participate. And they formed this team. It was only 11 people at that time in the 2016. 11 athletes were formed together to, so that they could compete and be part of it all. And there were 32 this year, teams of countries that, that were at war or couldn't participate for whatever reason. I, I have to say, I remember in 2016 when they first talked about the Olympic refugee team. And I listened to the um, president of IOA, or IOC, I think at that point, talk about this team, and I was so struck by what he said, I went and co I got a copy of his tank, because he was preaching, let me tell you, he was just preaching. And I, I, here's some of what he said, because I think Jesus would have liked this too. We are living in a world where selfishness is gaining ground. Here is our answer. 
the refugee Olympic team, refugee athletes, you are seeking hope. You are now giving hope to all refugees in the world. You are making a contribution to society. In this Olympic world, we do not just tolerate diversity. We welcome you as an enrichment to us. Do you ever think, don't, I love that. We welcome diversity as an enrichment to all of us. That is a powerful reminder that refugees of all types are part of the kingdom and bring enrichment and hope to all of us. So we are part of the parade of nations. We are part of the kingdom of God. And at the end of the scripture that I talked to, to, just read in 19 through 22, talks about Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation. If you're a builder, the cornerstone that you put down sets the tone of the whole building. If your cornerstone is off, it's going to be off. But Jesus is our cornerstone that sets the foundation for everything that we do. And that's where our focus needs to be. Jesus is our stability, our unity, our hope. All right, my second thing is the Olympic flame. Fifteen weeks ago, a single flame was lit by the, from the sun in the, Olymp, uh, the original site of the Olympics in Olympia, Greece. The, sing, the single flame um, represents the original pagan worship of Zeus, the god of uh, creation of the world and uh, of weather. And so it was thought to be that he was a creator of all and that light that came from that place honoring Zeus then would go out. So the flame, that original flame on every Olympics is then transported to the host country. And for 15 weeks before every Olympics, people carried the flame through the country. You have care of people all around. I remember when it, we were, the last time it was in Atlanta. Do you remember? I wasn't here, so I don't know. But uh, in, I was in Orlando, and I had friends who were part of the care, that would carry the flame. People could sign up or were invited for whatever reason. And they were part of the people that would work, they would carry them for a quarter of a mile and pass the light to somebody else who went on. And I can remember people stressing about it, that they went out and went running and stuck because they were so afraid that, and for their little section that they wouldn't be able to carry it or, or they would be gasping. They didn't want to be, you know, they wanted to look like they could run. They weren't runners like our marathon runners back there. So that they were worried about running and carrying it, wanted to represent that flame well. It was, a, it was a joy and an excitement when you were chosen to carry that flame. Isn't that what our faith is like? Christ has already chosen every single one of us to be flame carriers. That fire is a representation of God's power at work. When we look in the Old Testament in Ezekiel, when the Israelites were, were fleeing from the Pharaoh, what was it that guided them at night? It was a flame, a tower of flame that protected them at night and guided them. Flame has always sent, reminded us of the flame of God. We see a flame as the Holy Spirit of God working in our lives. And in the United Methodist Church, we have the flame on the cross 
because we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that works and transforms lives. Amen? Where's my good Methodist? Amen? Amen. All right, thank you. The Olympic flame is shared one person at a time throughout the country and comes to rest at the Olympic Games and is passed on. And this year was sort of interesting. Instead of just French people of the French nature, they had people, Olympians from other countries as well. But it was the French that then lit the, the cauldron. That symbol of the flame that is part of the Olympics. I'll give you an aside. I've had people say, why in the world did they have a hot air balloon as a cauldron? Because hot air balloons used to be one of the competitions uh, at one point, especially in France. And so it was a great reminder, as well as the arts, there were medals given for arts as well. Um, so you saw that represented in the opening ceremonies all the way around. So we recognize God as our creator, our hope. I think it's very interesting that um, we are called to be torchbearers, each one of us. We are called to be torchbearers. And one of the things that the, the torches that my friends who ran it told me is they're heavy. They're a lot heavier than they expected. And sometimes they were hard to run and carry. What we carry for Christ is heavy sometimes too. It's not always easy to live the life that we're called to live, to be the example that we're called to be, to be the faith reminder of, of an act of loving God in the world. We have to be that representative. And it can get heavy sometimes, Karen, it. And we can run out of air sometimes as we go. But the Spirit of God is with us. The Olympic athletes, they become aware of the responsibility of being torchbearers as well. Tobin Heath, she was on the um, soccer team, not this last one, um, or not the current one, and she she became very convinced of how she had to be a representative of Christ after being in the Olympics. And she said her scripture was Matthew 5, 16. <coughs> Excuse me. Let your light shine. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine. And she has really since embraced the idea of being a role model for Christ and using her Olympic um, experience as an opportunity to share Christ to all people. She states that she plays to glorify God. And I want to give you a quote that she says. My soccer career isn't about worldly outcome in terms of winning or losing. It's about Jesus being known, not in a way that forces it on other people, but in a way that lets people know how he has transformed my life and given me purpose, meaning, love, and satisfaction. That's the message of Jesus. It's not a platform to impose on people. It's a platform to love people. I worship God with the gifts he has given me. That's my motivation when I step on the field every day. I am just a vessel to share those gifts with others, and hopefully his love shines through everything I do. Isn't that our hope, too? Isn't that our hope, 
that everything we do represents Christ and people can see Christ in us. The medals that they've been given when they win have been forged and they're, there's something very special about these medals that there's some original iron from the, uh, or iron from the original Eiffel Tower that has been placed in every single medal. I think about that for us. Those medals were forged by the fire, representing what they did, their accomplishments, their hard work. But we have been forged by the flames of Jesus Christ. We've been forged by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in each one of us, there is a peace, a part, a wholeness of Christ, of the Holy Spirit to be the representatives and to go out and let our light shine. Amen.
Put your hand, I want you to carry, have your torch. You got it? You're carrying the flame of Christ, all right? Now put it here. Because the life of Christ is in our hearts. We have been filled with the power and the courage to go out and be the people of God. You up for it? Yeah. You ready for to play the games? Well, not play, to, to go out and be the kingdom of God. We're not to play at it. That's the problem. We play at it too much. We're to go and be the kingdom of God. All right. So as you're watching the Olympics, start listening for those witnesses of faith as you're watching the Olympics. I've pulled some from the last Olympics, but I always can find some as they talk. So share with me as you hear those um, witnesses of faith in the next two weeks as we go through the Olympics together. All right, y'all ready for me to finish? Okay. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. And all God's people joyfully said, Amen. Go get them, guys.